Hey there, thanks so much for joining the podcast of Discovery Church today. As we get ready to jump into the message content for this episode, we want to sincerely thank each of you for sharing this podcast with friends and family. You know, one of the very best ways that you can help us is to like and subscribe to this podcast. It's so appreciated. We want to bring content each week that's full of the Word and the Spirit, and we hope that it blesses you as you listen today, as you watch today, as we get into the teaching right now. Thank you, Mark. God bless you, Discovery. How are you guys doing today? How many are ready for the Word of God? Amen. Well, first and foremost, I want to just take a moment and honor your pastor, Pastor Don. Uh, How many know you have an amazing pastor, Pastor Don? I was, I was sharing with Mark, uh, you know, that I got on the website to kind of check out the church and look at the archives and stream the messages just to get kind of a feel, uh, you know, see what I was in store, right, what was in store for me. And I got hooked on his messages. I just kept watching one after another after another. I'm like, man, this guy is good. And so uh, I love your pastor, love the message that God has put in his heart, amazing Bible teacher. And I'm telling you that if I lived in Orlando, I'd be coming to Discovery Church, amen. And so we're going to probably learn a little bit of Spanish today uh, because I don't know if you know this, but that's what we're going to be talking or speaking in heaven is Spanish. (laughs) So you're going to kind of be a little lost If all you know is burrito and taco and nacho (laughs) and baño, (laughs) right? And so, uh, but as Mark mentioned, we come from deep South Texas. We're right along the Rio Grande, about 10 minutes from the border. Very unique uh, area in the state of Texas. And we do some ministry across the border into Mexico. And our church is unique in that it offers bilingual services. So we have all English services. We have all Spanish services, and then we have some services that are bilingual where I self-translate. And so I just got rid of the the interpreter altogether, and I started translating myself some years ago. So if we were at Cross Church this morning, you would hear something like this. Hey, guys, thank you all for being at church today. Hola a todos, gracias por estar con nosotros en la iglesia hoy en este día. I believe God has a special word for you. Creo que Dios tiene una palabra especial para tu vida. I know that you're going to be blessed with the message that God has given me. Yo sé que usted va a ser muy bendecido con el mensaje que Dios me ha dado. How many are happy to be in the house of God? ¿Cuántos están contentos de estar en la casa de Dios? And so my messages are twice as long, <laughs> you know, but, but the flip side is I get to pick up two offerings, English. And s- That's just a joke. That's just a joke. Sorry, Pastor Don. <laughs> but we're excited to be here. Uh, I am accompanied by my beautiful wife for about 25 years. We'll be celebrating 25 years uh, this month of July. So she's right here, Rosemary Loya. We have four wonderful children uh, who are also here with us, but they couldn't get up early enough to be at church. So we're kind of on the other side. We're over there by uh, Lake Buena Vista or that area. And so, uh, but we're happy to be here. And uh, I want to share with you what I believe is going to be a life-giving, life-changing message. You know, in the New Testament, when we look at the ministry of Jesus, he made reference to certain Old Testament characters and not many so when jesus preaches about you that means you're a big deal right so if jesus talked about abraham and jesus talked about moses and he referenced uh, david and he didn't talk about everybody but he talked about a few people and one of those individuals is a prophet by the name of jonah how many who are here have ever heard the story of jonah 
All right, so the majority of those who are here, maybe those that are watching online or at one of our campuses, uh, have heard the story of Jonah. I mean, most people have heard of Jonah, even if you're not a Christian. Right, he got swallowed up by some big fish and something went wrong and then he got thrown up on dry land and he went to some crazy city by the name of Nineveh. And so we're going to get into the story here in just a moment. But Jesus references Jonah in Matthew chapter 12 where the Bible says that some of the scribes and some of the Pharisees came to him and said, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now I know I'm not the only one, but I've asked God for a sign. A time or two right but this time it was different because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the people that the Bible is describing were people who wanted to see a sign in order to believe see we're not looking for a sign in order to believe we are already for the most part believers and the Bible says that signs follow them who believe and the sign of a believer are signs and wonders and miracles according to the gospel of Mark. And Jesus answered them and he said an evil adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given unto you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And there it is where Jesus himself mentions the name of this prophet by the name of Jonah. And he goes on to say for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So the son of man must be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, what was Jesus talking about when he said that the Son of Man, speaking of himself, must be in the heart or the belly of the earth for three days and three nights? We know that Jesus was talking about his very own death, burial, and resurrection. I don't know about you, but that's pretty phenomenal, right? He predicted that he would die be buried for exactly three days, right? And then he was going to resurrect from the dead, proving once and for all that he was and is who he said he was, which is the only begotten son of God. And so he likens himself to the prophet Jonah in this way. He said, look, just like Jonah was, in the belly of the fish, so I will be in the heart of the earth. But you know something interesting about the story of Jonah is Jonah didn't stay in the belly of the fish. Neither did Jesus stay in the heart of the earth. The Bible says that on the third day he rose again with power and great glory. How many who are here know that we serve a risen Savior? We're not just worshiping a crucified Christ that's only part of the message right that Jesus died for our sins but not only did he die the Bible says that he also rose from the dead he came out of that grave he conquered sin death hell and the grave and he says this is the only sign that I'm going to give to you and this sign should be enough to prove once and for all that I am who I say I am and then he gives them a warning he says the man of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and they will condemn you they will accuse you they will judge you because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, when Jonah delivered the message to Nineveh, the Bible says that those wicked men opened up their heart and received this message. And as a result, they repented. That's the idea. That's the point. That's the purpose of the message to get us to turn our heart back to God. And then Jesus says something powerful, and I love the way Jesus ends this passage because he says a greater than Jonah is here. I mean, if you guys are impressed with Jonah, if you guys like the story of a big old fish, I'm here to let you know that there is a greater one than Jonah that is right here in your midst. How many know that Jesus is that greater one? That he's greater than sickness. He's greater than disease. He's greater than any situation. He's greater than any circumstance. The Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We serve a God that is greater. 
And Jesus made that point when he spoke about Jonah. He goes, look, Jonah preached. The people repented. This was the sign. And yet right before your eyes, there is a greater one than Jonah. More than a prophet. Jesus, the son of God. So what is it about the story of Jonah that you and I can learn? Well, his story is found in Jonah in chapter 1. Starting with verse 1, the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. It was one of the largest cities in that day. It would be the equivalent, listen, because some of you already know the story of Jonah, and you know how wicked the men of Nineveh were. And some of you say, well, I would have obeyed God the first time around. I beg to differ. I met a young man the other day as I was preaching at a convention for the Assemblies of God who is a missionary. So I thought that was pretty cool, right? This guy's a missionary. I'm like, okay, where do you do your missionary work? He says, Baghdad. I'm like, okay, that's not a place I would want to go to preach the gospel, right? Send me to Cancun. (laughs) Send me to Hawaii. I mean, I'm there, right? I'll sign up. But not Baghdad. But how many know people in Baghdad need God too? People in Baghdad, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, they need Jesus too. So what God is asking Jonah to do is the equivalent of God sending you and I to one of these areas in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan where people are hostile to the gospel. Where people don't want to hear that they have a totally different set of values and ideology and philosophy and theology and by you going and preaching if you will and delivering the message is risking your very own life so I don't blame Jonah right he got on a Disney cruise went the other way right that's what I love about cruises right all you can eat 24 (laughs) 7 Right, the Bible says that God told Jonah, gave him a specific assignment and said, this is where I want you to go and this is what I want you to do. And the Bible says that Jonah, being the faithful servant of God that he was, he arose and he fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Not to the presence of the Lord. Not to the city that God had called him to. In fact, he went, you could say, in the exact opposite direction. So he went down to Joppa. He found a ship that was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. Once again, from the presence of the Lord. I'm going to be speaking to you today about the ships that can take us to or from the presence of God. Some of you this morning are on the wrong ship. And your ship, believe it or not, is taking you farther away from God. And what I want to do, I want to do my very best this morning with the help of the Holy Spirit to make sure that you and I and those who are watching are on the right ship. Because the Bible says that as soon as Jonah got on this ship, the Bible says that God sent a great wind on the sea. How many know that God controls the climate? Right? I don't know about global warming. All I know is God controls the climate. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was broken up. The mariners were afraid. I mean, these are men, right, that were used to being in the ocean. So when you got a Navy SEAL who's crying like a little girl, I'm going to freak out, right? (laughs) I mean, these were mariners. These were experienced sailors, and they themselves were afraid. Can you imagine the wind? Can you imagine the wave? Can you imagine the storm on that day? The Bible says the ship that Jonah was on was about to be broken up. What does that tell us? He was on the wrong ship. He should have never gotten into that ship, but he got on it anyway. And the Bible says that this great storm came to his life. Everyone started to cry, cry out to their own God. They threw the cargo over the ship into the sea to lighten the load. Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship, laying down and was fast asleep. 
He took his sleeping aid, his melatonin, <laughs> knocked out, right? Se durmió. Let me throw that Spanish in there. <laughs> Se durmió este tipo. This guy just knocked out. And so the captain came and woke him up and said, what do you mean, sleeper, arise, call on your God? Perhaps your God will consider us so that we will not perish. One of the things that you and I can learn from the story of Jonah is that we can find ourselves in an unnecessary storm due to our own poor choices and bad decisions. I believe that this was a storm that Jonah did not have to go through. No tuvo que pasar esta tempestad, Jonás. No lo tuvo que pasar. He did not have to go through this storm, but because he chose to get in this ship, right? It was probably a carnival. Yeah. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> right? I'm just kidding. If there's any carnival people, God bless you. We love you. Keep up, the good, keep up the good work, amen. He's going in the wrong direction, right? And he finds himself in this storm. Un there was no reason for him to go through this storm. And some of us, unfortunately, believe it or not, are going through a storm of our own making. We don't have to be going through this situation. We don't have to be going through this circumstance. But because we wanted to do it our way and not God's way, we'd prefer to go down this path and not the right path. We went the way of the world and not the way of the word. Now we're fi we find ourselves in a storm and our ship is falling apart. God sent the storm. Please listen. God did not send the storm to kill Jonah. God sent the storm to save Jonah. You see, God is still God even in the middle of the storm. God is still God even in the midst of the sea. We see the stories in the New, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where Jesus found him, uh, himself on more than one occasion in the storm at sea with his disciples. And yet Jesus was still in control. I believe as long as Jesus is in your boat, you're going to make it. As long as you have Jesus in your heart, you have hope. The storm, once again, was not sent to destroy Jonah. It was meant to correct him. So what are the three ships that I'm talking about when we talk about the fact that there are some ships that can take us to or from our destination the first one is relationship and if you're taking notes feel free to write that down relationship you can be in the right relationship or you can be in the wrong relationship the second ship I'm going to speak on is worship worship who are you worshiping how are you worshiping and the third ship I'm going to speak on today is stewardship what are you doing with the things that God has entrusted to you? So if we go back to verse 5, where we read just a moment ago, the Bible says, and the mariners were afraid. That tells me that Jonah was not on this ship by himself, right? There was other passengers. There was other people on that same ship, on that same boat, but they were also going in the wrong directions this is relationship some of us are in relationship with people that we should not be in relationship with because their lives listen are not going in the same direction that our life is going in or that we want our life to go in who are you sailing with this morning who's a part of your inner circle and within this relationship, we need to understand that the greatest relationship of all is obviously our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the greatest, by far, relationship that you and I can have because our relationship with Christ not only affects our life here on earth, it impacts our eternity. It determines where you and I will spend eternity, our final final destination for all ages and for all time that relationship with Jesus Christ and within that relationship there's all sorts of ships right you got friendships 
people we hang out with, people we do life with, maybe our neighbors. And those friendships, believe it or not, can take you to God or they can take you away from God. And one of the things that we need to be careful with in our friendships is that we are influencing them more than they're influencing us. God put those friends in your life not so that they could lead you astray. God put those so-called friends in your life so that you could lead them to him. Lead them to him. How are you doing with that? How is that working out for you? Are you leading your friends to Christ? I remember when I first got saved at the age of 16, God radically changed my life. And like many of you, I just, you know, stopped doing the things I was doing. Many of my friends took notice and they said, hey, you're no longer, you know, cussing or you're no longer partying or you're no longer doing this or you're no longer doing that. And the fact of the matter is that I was on a different ship. I was headed somewhere. I felt that God had a destiny for my life. And so we started Cross Church. I was 20 years old when we planted that church. 20 something years ago in our living room and now meeting on multiple campuses thousands of people and I'm still sailing with Jesus how many can say amen but once again when we're talking about relationships that's the first boat that's the first ship we're talking about once again those relationships can take you closer to God but they can also lead you far far away if you show me your friends chances are I can see your future Tell me who you're with, who you run with, and I'll tell you who you are. In Spanish, there's a phrase, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. That means tell me who you run with, and I will tell you who you are. Within relationships, we also find something called courtship. Right? Some of you are courting right now. Some of you are dating. One of the things I tell my daughters, because they're a little older now, they're adults, I tell them, don't date somebody you wouldn't marry. That's just a rule of thumb. I think it's a good rule to have in your life. Don't date somebody that you wouldn't marry. If you're not attracted to them, if they don't have God in their life, if their personality clashes with yours, if that's not the type of person that you can see yourself spending the rest of your life with, then why start on that journey? Why go down that road? Why get into that relation? Ship, if you already know that your lives are headed in two different directions, we also find partnerships, right? We get into business. We sign a contract. We do a deal with people who are ungodly, unethical, who don't share the same faith and the same values that you and I have. And within relationships, there's something special called a fellowship. A fellowship. What is a fellowship? A fellowship, my friend, is a congregation, a local congregation, just like Discovery. This in itself, you could say, is a ship. Right? We have all of these campuses, and we're building, and we're expanding for the future and for your family. We're part of a fellowship. And this ship is going somewhere. This ship has a predetermined destination. And I believe that God has great things in store for Discovery Church. How many believe that this morning? It's a great ship to be a part of. This is a great church. And as I said just a moment ago, if I was in Orlando, chances are I'd be coming, right? I'd be the Spanish pastor. El pastor en español, right? For all of my Latin friends, <laughs> maybe we need a, a discovery in Espanol, right? Who knows? Praise God. But we have this fellowship. And I, for one, believe that it matters where you go to church. I just do. I don't believe all churches are equal. And I don't believe that all churches are going in the same direction. I believe that you have to find the fellowship that is right for you and right for your family. A place where you can connect with Jesus Christ. A place like this where you are being spiritually fed and you are coming alive. That has wonderful worship, Bible-based teaching that is filled with the presence and the power of God. I have just described for you Discovery Church. This fellowship. This relationship. 
that you have with one another, that you have with your ministry team or that you have with your small group, that fellowship is important. The Bible says in Acts in chapter 2 that the disciples, the early church, they fellowshiped. They prayed together. They did community together. And I believe that matters to God. And if it matters to God, it ought to matter to us. So all these men, all these mariners are on this ship with Jonah and they find themselves in the middle of a storm. And the Bible says, and every man cried out to his own God. These were not believers, right? They probably had some type of idol or pagan God and they got in some serious trouble I don't know how many who are here would like to be in the middle of the sea in the midst of a hurricane not many well these men were there and they began to cry out to their own God and my question to you is where do you go when you're in trouble what do you do and where do you go and who do you call? Because whoever you look for, what I call your go-to is your God. Whatever you go to, that's your God. When you're in trouble, when you're stressed out, when you're under pressure, when you're anxious, when you're depressed, what do you go to? Who do you go to? Because whatever you go to is your God. That is what you worship, believe it or not. To worship means to exalt, to put first, to look for. All of these men were looking for peace, were looking for answers in so many different things and they could not find it. You might be worshiping something you ought not to be worshiping. How is your worship? Because the Bible says that when we find Jonah, his worship wasn't all that. In fact, he was asleep when he should have been praying. How many have ever fallen asleep praying? How many have ever fallen asleep in church? Sorry, Pastor Don, if you're watching this right now, nobody raise your hand just so you know. It's awesome church. Right? I tell my church, it's so easy to fall asleep in church because nobody knows if you're sleeping or if you're praying. Right? You just close your eyes. And everyone thinks you're being spiritual. Right, so, but when they found Jonah, they heard him snoring apparently. He wasn't praying. His worship wasn't too hot. And maybe your worship isn't where it is supposed to be. Your spiritual life is not as hot as it should be. Maybe your spiritual life or your passion for God is not what it used to be. You might be on the wrong ship. Maybe you're coming into this church and instead of being a participant, you're simply spectating. You enjoy the songs, but you are not engaging. You hear about the groups and you see all the amazing things and hear all of the powerful testimonies, but you have yet to be part of that community. Once again, what you go to is your God. How is your worship this morning? How is your prayer life today? How often do you read the Bible? I heard a statistic the other day that Barna Research did where they, they, they surveyed like a thousand pastors or something like that. And they asked them, how long do you pray on a weekly basis? And the average pastor prays 15 minutes a week. And I thought to myself, if that's the pastor, you can imagine the people. Jonah wasn't praying, right? Jonah wasn't singing one of these amazing songs. Jonah was fast asleep when he should have been praying. The boat was in trouble. People were almost about to die. And so it is in the lives of so many of us. Maybe our marriages are on the rocks. Our children are on drugs. Our business is going bankrupt. And instead of praying, we are we're sleeping. We're sleeping and spiritual slumber is an indication of the condition of our heart. Our worship is not what it is supposed to be. And your worship, if you worship the right thing, which is God, the right person, it'll take you closer to him. And there's nothing like worship that helps bring you into the presence of God. But on the same token, if you worship the wrong thing, 
then that worship will take you eventually away from God. And then the third thing I want to talk about is stewardship. The Bible says that when these men got in trouble, they could find no other answer but to lighten the load by getting rid of the cargo. Now, I can just imagine, right, what they might have thrown overboard. I don't know if it was jewelry, if it was clothes, if it was whiskey, if it was gold. There could have been a ton of stuff there, but obviously it had some value. But in the middle of the storm, whatever they had lost its value. Their life was more important. Stewardship. I'm talking to you this morning about what are you doing with the things that God has given you. At the end of the day, when you get in trouble, when your marriage or your kids or your family are in dire need, none, no money, no amount of money that you have is worth much if you can't fix the problem. And there are some problems that you and I will encounter, some storms that we may go through that money can't fix. But there is a God. There is a God who hears and answers prayer. There is a God that is just a call away. And the Bible says that these men began to get rid of everything that they had. I heard a person once say that we will sacrifice our families and we will sacrifice our health in order to get wealth. And then later on in life, we'll give it all away just to have our health and our families back. What is it worth? What you and I have, what is it worth if you throw it away? What is it worth? I believe that many of the things that God has entrusted to him, the only things that have value, church, are the things that you and I give to God. The things that impact eternity. And this story shows and this story proves that everything else is expendable. Everything else can be thrown overboard in order to spare and save your very life. Jesus said, what does it profit a man? If he gains the whole world, but at the end of the day, he loses his own soul. Stewardship. Stewardship is not just a matter of money. Stewardship is a matter of the heart. What are you doing with the things that God has given you? Your treasure your time, and your talent. Speaking about talent, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus shares a powerful parable of these men that were given various talents. And you've heard the message before. I heard the message online that Pastor Don preached and taught of the talents. And those talents represented a very large sum of money. It's not what you have, it's what you do with what you have that matters. Most of us who are here, if not all of us, and those who are watching have been extremely blessed by God. And we have been blessed according to the Bible so that we can be a blessing to others. Well, these men in Matthew chapter 25, they each received a certain amount of talents, which was a certain sum of money. And some of them did what was right. And some of them, one of them did not. And that which he had was taken away. And once again, my question to you is what are you doing with what God has given you? Because your stewardship can either take you closer to God if you do what God desires for you to do with what he's giving you or your stewardship can take you away from God. As a pastor of over 20 years, I've seen so many people chase wealth, chase fame, chase fortune to their own despair and demise. They went overboard with the cargo. They couldn't afford to let it go. That became more important to them than their own wife and their own children, than their own integrity and credibility. Stewardship, once again, church, is not just about having more. It's about doing more with what you and I have. And so the Bible says that when they finally woke Jonah up, Jonah confessed he said, I'm the man, I'm the reason, I'm the problem on this boat. I'm the reason we're in this situation. Jonah was at least man enough to admit that he was in the wrong ship 
And there was only one solution, and that was to throw Jonah overboard. And when they did, the Bible says the sea ceased from its raging now the lord had prepared a great fish to swallow jonah and jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights and i'm going to close with this in jonah chapter 2 the bible says in verse 10 and god spoke to the fish and the fish vomited jonah on dry land i bet you didn't know that god speaks fish <laughs> right Dios habla español también. God speaks Chinese and he speaks French and God speaks all these different languages. God speaks to insects and he speaks to reptiles and he speaks to bees and he speaks to the birds. And apparently God speaks fish. I wish I had that gift because I'm a fisherman. <laughs> and sometimes I go fishing and I don't catch anything. And I do speak to the fish, but I don't think I'm speaking their language because they don't listen. I'm like, bite the hook. The bait's right in front of you. What else do you want, right? Well, God speaks fish, and God speaks so many different languages, and God speaks to situations, and God speaks to circumstance, and in this case, God spoke to the fish, and God spoke to Jonah through the fish. And he said, it's your choice. When Jonah got vomited on dry land, he had a choice. And it's the same choice that you and I have today. We can either choose, Jonah could have decided, you know what, I'm going to get on another cruise. Going the other way, not carnival this time. <laughs> he said, or, or, I can choose to obey God and do what God has called me to do. And the result of that was a nationwide revival that erupted in the city of Nineveh because a man simply obeyed. And what I want to do today in just a moment, we're going to, Sing a song and you'll have time to reflect. But I want to ask you a question. What ship are you on? Relationship? Worship? Stewardship? Are any of those three things taking you farther from God or are they bringing you closer to God? Do you need to disembark at the next port and make sure you board on the right ship? Because some of you, when you leave here today, you're going to be faced with a choice and you're going to have the courage and need the courage in order to make that change. To walk away, to break up with that person, to ask for forgiveness from that family member. I don't know what ship you're on, but I believe that God desires for you to be on the right ship the ship that's going to take you to your destiny. Would you just bow your head and close your eyes right there where you're at? I only got a couple of minutes left. I believe that this is a message that God has given me specifically for you. I've never preached this message anywhere else but discovery. And when I was praying and preparing and saying, God, what do you want me to say? God said, this is what you're going to say. And I want to be a faithful servant of God and deliver to you what God has put in my heart. Some of you, you're on the right ship and your life is going great and you're seeing the abundant blessings of God because of your obedience and sacrifice. Some of us who are here and some of us that are at the various campuses might have to admit that we're, we boarded the wrong ship. We got in a wrong relationship. We haven't been good stewards. We're in the wrong stewardship. Maybe our worship isn't what it's supposed to be. Maybe we're not worshiping God like we used to. Maybe we're sleeping when we ought to be praying. All of these ships, once again, church, can either take you to God or they can lead you far, far away. And you need to decide this morning what ship you're going to be in. What ship are you going to be to board? Where do you want to end up? Do you want to end up outside of the will of God or do you want to end up smack dab in the middle of God's will for your life? And it's all about getting on the right ship. Once again, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, would you just reflect for just a moment? Just examine your heart. Evaluate. If there's an area in your life where you need to ask God for forgiveness, won't you do that right now? God is more than willing to forgive you right now.
Maybe you find yourself not in the ship. You're in the belly of the well. You've been, you've been devastated. and You find yourself in a, a tragedy and going through an urgent need. And you're like, I need God to do something. It's all about choices. It's all about ships. What ship are you on this morning? What ship is your family on? I'm reminded right now by the Holy Spirit of the story of Noah. How Noah preached to so many people the saving grace of God and warned them of the flood to come. But at the end of the day, it was only Noah and his family. And I'm here to tell you, and this might seem selfish, but I'm going to say it anyway. If no one else is on your boat, you make sure you get your family on board. You make sure your family is on that salvation ship that leads to eternal life. I don't know what you got to do. I don't know what you got to say. You might have to pray a little more, but you make sure that you and your family are are serving the Lord that is God's message to you today God will give you the courage and the words that you need to make that course correction in your life for you to go back home make amends with your wife start respecting your husband make a decision today to be a part of community join a small group Make the decision that it's time for you to start serving God because your worship isn't what it's supposed to be. And you might need to join a serve team, a ministry, a department. Some of you need to go back home, go back to your workplace. Start encouraging people, demonstrating the love of God right there where you're at. I got one minute left. I'm going to pray for you and those who are watching online. And at all campuses, Father God, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for this message that I believe is straight from the heart of God for us today. You're talking to us about relationships, about our worship. Maybe we're not worshiping the way we're supposed to. Maybe we're not worshiping the way we used to. We're sleeping when we should be praying. We're sitting when we should be standing. We're yawning when we should be singing. God, our stewardship, what are we doing with the things that we've been given? Because at the end of the day, we're going to have to give an account for all of that. And we pray that we would hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I pray right now for every single person who is here and every single person that is a part of Discovery Church. I pray that your abundant grace and your everlasting love and mercy will come upon them wherever they are, Lord God, in the middle of the storm, in the midst of the sea, that you would speak peace to their life, peace to their family, peace to their situation, and that you would help them today have the courage to get off the wrong ship and get on the right ship where Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, and Captain. We pray this in his holy name. And everyone said, Amen. Y Amen. God bless you, church. Dios les bendiga. Worship the Lord with us. Adore a Dios con nosotros.